Welcome to Candid Conversation number 371. We're going over these bafflers from the Bible, which I don't really think they're from the Bible, but okay. Uh, the next question we've got is, should I go into debt now? Well, that all depends. Remember, the Bible says, owe no man anything but to love one another. So your default solution should be not to go into debt at all if you can help it. It may, it may seem weird, but the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. People who go into debt are more likely to love money. And you may say, well, how is that? I mean, if you're going into debt, you have less money. Well, the problem is that when you go into debt, you're more likely to be concerned with money because you got to pay your bills. And more people, for example, play the lotto today because um, they feel like they they got all this credit card debt, house, and car, and whatever. They got so much debt that they try got to try to get out of it. A lot of people feel like they just can't get their head above water. And a lot of times, I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. A lot of times, that's just how it is. I understand that. But it's when it comes to money, it should all be all about the attitude. If you are able to not go into debt and to have some money in the bank in case of emergencies, you're a lot less likely to be worried about money, thinking about it less likely to love it so my advice of course is that like if for example you get a car get you an old car don't buy a brand new car or if you're gonna buy a house get one that is less expensive and make do with that the less debt you have the better and I understand you may say well you know you could lease a car you could rent a house and not go into debt at all. But really, if you do that option, you're going into debt more. If I buy a house and I have a 30-year mortgage, that means after 30 years, theoretically, I've paid it off and I own the house. But if I rent a house, I'm not paying off anything. I'm not accumulating any wealth, which means that essentially... I'm going to pay on that house forever, as long as I live, because I don't get any equity in it. So when the Bible says, owe no man anything except to love one another, it doesn't mean you can't go into debt. And actually, to get out of having money being a burden, sometimes you, actually, you do have to go into debt. So my advice is, love not the world, neither the things of the world as John said in one of his epistles. And if you do that, then you are more practical-minded instead of having to get the brand new car or the house that is double the price of the other one that you could make do with. It's better to get a cheaper house, get a used car, and then you're not in debt as much. Get those paid off and try to save some money. And that way, you don't love money to the point of trying to get other things and constantly striving and you know getting a better job or anything like that and then you're able to focus more on allowing Christ to live in you and you're not burdened down with oh I got all this debt and how am I gonna get out of debt but you can allow Christ to live in you more not worried about money Jesus he never worried about money he didn't have a place to lay his head and yet he gave the money over to Judas Iscariot, said, you know, you take care of it. I'm not going to worry about that stuff. He figured money was, le uh, uh, was a temptation. And he's facing enough temptations that it, as it is without the money tempting him. So he doesn't, so he doesn't uh, bother with that. And so my advice when it comes to money, I mean, you've got to handle your money and your finances. But do it in such a way to not... Put your head under water, but to get a house and a car 
that you can afford that's cheaper make do with less you know the the phone bill you know don't get the latest and greatest cell phone with all the options the high cost of all the data plans don't get the high cost cable bills there are all these things out here that take your money and you can find cheaper alternatives usually than what most people choose which will be less debt less hassle and then more peace of mind and you don't have to worry about the money so much so that's just a practical thing next question is cremation right or wrong no it's not really right or wrong it's just an option you can do that all cremation does is it gets the body to go back to the dust a little faster if you have a body that you bury well then it's going to take some time for it to rot and decay but eventually it's going to pass away if you cremate the body well then you go ahead and burn it and so you don't have to worry about the years and years of the decay process so it doesn't really matter either way people say well you got to have a body got to bury the body you can't cremate the body because Christ is going to raise the body from the dead or you can't spread your ashes at the sea because how is Christ going to be able to raise you from the dead when part of you is in one part of the sea and other parts in another part of the sea how does that work well God is overall he knows everything you can't get away from him so no matter what you do whether you cremate and throw, scatter the ashes from a plane and you're all over the place or if you get your body buried in a coffin and you put it in the ground either way God is going to make a glorified body and give it to you it doesn't limit God God doesn't say oh no I was gonna raise him from the dead but since he spread his ashes from an airplane I can't put the pieces together now God is okay with that he can take whatever and you think of some of those Saints of old think of Abraham for example his body has been in the grave for what 3,500 years whether he was cremated or he was buried doesn't make a bit of difference the body is gone Jesus told Adam dust thou you were made from the dust and you're going to return to the dust so Abraham 3,500 years later is just a bunch of dust so God is going to raise a glorified body for Abraham just as much as he would for someone who was buried yesterday and the rapture comes today it doesn't matter to God he can make a glorified body for believers and for unbelievers he's going to make a body that doesn't decay and the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched so the worm they continue to live forever in, in hell so um, cremation it doesn't matter you know, what you do to the body there is no life in the body anymore once someone's dead you know, when someone's alive you can't kill the body burn the body up when someone is alive because that would kill the person but when someone's already dead the soul has departed the body you can do whatever you want with the body you can stomp on it trample it set it on fire do whatever it's just a lifeless form there's no life in it you know it's just like a tree a tree is alive but once you chop the tree down you can do whatever you want with it you can just leave it on the ground you can chop it up use it for firewood you could uh, use it to bake something in the oven you know whatever you want to do with that it's fine so it's the same thing with the body and it doesn't hurt God's ability to raise the body any if you cremate it versus if you bury it okay next question are credit cards associated with the mark of the beast uh, well no uh, the mark of the beast is something it's a mark probably a leopard spot according to Revelation 13 verse 2 I believe it is that the beast is resurrected he looks like a leopard and so it's probably a leopard spot since it's a mark of the beast it's like him it makes sense that it would be a leopard spot because if you it goes in either the forehead or in the right hand and when you look at 
major religions, all of them have a sort of a leopard spot that they put on the forehead. For Christians, they use Ash Wednesday. Sort of looks like that circle there in between. And it's no coincidence that all the major religions have a circle that they put in the middle of the forehead. Christians, it's Ash Wednesday. Islam, they have the prayer bump. Hindu has a little red dot. Uh, Judaism has the phylactery box that they put in the middle there. I'm not sure what Buddha, I don't know of anything they have. So, it makes sense that it would be a mark. It's in the right hand or in the forehead. If you get a credit card that's not in the right hand or the forehead, it's in your wallet. It's something outside of the body. It's given out. And it doesn't really matter even if they... I, for example, right now I've heard that uh, in Sweden they've got... They're starting to implant a chip into the left hand, I believe it is, of people. So, get rid of identity theft so they, they can um, buy and sell just through that chip. So, the more you... Now, that right there, just like the credit cards, the more you get away from actual money and you get into computer stuff, the more likely, closer you are to the mark of the beast. Because the mark of the beast, okay, it's a leopard spot in the forehead or in the hand. But it's got to, they either, they buy or sell with that. And so, <coughs> there's got to be some kind of computer, some way to read, some way to read uh, that chip or whatever it is. You know, it's a mark. It's a mark like a leopard spot in the forehead or in the hand. But there's got to be some information tied to that in order to allow you to buy or sell. So it's got to be some kind of computer thing tied to that mark to say, this is Eric, he has X number of dollars in his account, therefore he can buy this, and then we deduct it from his account. So there's got to be some kind of computer associated with it. So the closer you get to that technology-wise, the closer you are to the mark of the beast. So when you ask credit cards associated with the mark of the beast, well, that's a step closer than cash. If I have to have cash on me, then that's something that's not associated with me. I can give it to somebody else. Uh, you don't know, you know, if you pay me in cash, you don't know who's got the money or anything like that. But if it's a credit card, well, that's tied to my name. So now you're starting to track purchases by my name rather than just by this money that can be given to anybody else. Then when you get to a chip that's implanted, well then, now you are tracking it by, by person and there's no way to disassociate you from those transactions because you have to have you there in order for that to work. Which makes me wonder, are they going to like, a lot of purchases today are online, so... Are you going to have to scan your forehead or scan your hand to make these online purchases? I don't know. but uh, So, credit cards aren't associated with the Mark of the Beast and that they're not... The Mark of the Beast, you don't have that. Even in, like in Sweden where they have the chip implanted in the hand, that's still not the Mark of the Beast. The Mark of the Beast is a leopard spot that is put in the hand or on the forehead by the Antichrist and his goons and it tracks all your purchases and it keeps you from buying or selling anything unless you have that. So until we get to that point, then there is no mark of the beast. The beast doesn't show up until halfway through the tribulation period. So the mark of the beast cannot show up by definition until after the Antichrist makes a seven year covenant with Israel. The two witnesses are on the earth for three and a half years. They kill the Antichrist then Satan raises it from the dead and he kills the two witnesses. Until that happens, then it's after that that you have the false prophet comes, the image to the beast is created, people fall down and worship that, and then there is a mark of the beast created. So until all those events happen, there is no such thing as the mark of the beast. Now 
credit cards are a step toward the technology that is necessary for the mark of the beast to work. Chip in the hand is a lot closer than that, but so but they're actually not associated with the mark of the beast until the false prophet actually declares there to be a mark by which buying and selling is the only way that it can happen through that mark. Okay, next question. What do you think of long hair for a man? I think that comes from 1 Corinthians 11 where it talks about that even nature tells you that it is a shame for a woman to be have her head shaved and it is uh, it is a shame for men to have long hair. Nature says that women's hair should be long and men's hair should be short. And that has to do with the fact that the woman is the more beautiful creature, outwardly speaking, than the man. And the long hair makes you, for the most part, makes you more beautiful. So it's something that nature says that basically women are more concerned with their outward appearance than men and so they are going to be more likely to try to make themselves beautiful with the long hair. If a man does that, it means, well, he's not going to be working hard or, you know, whatever the connotation is with that. And he's just concerned, he's vain, he's concerned about himself. And so he's supposed to have short hair. Paul just mentions that in 1 Corinthians 11 in the context of head coverings to try to show that women are to wear head coverings whenever they prophesy or pray in the church, meaning using their spiritual gift of prayer or prophesying. It was an unusual period. We were told by Paul that women are to keep silent in church. But at the same time, until the Word of God was completed, there was gifts of prophecy whereby any person, man or woman, because in the body of Christ, Galatians 3 says, there is neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So, when you have in the flesh, when you have a man or a woman in a church, because the woman, Eve, was deceived in the transgression. She is to submit, wives are to submit unto their husbands, and women are to keep silent in the church. Women have a different mind, a different way of thinking than men, and God made man's mind to process and to teach sound doctrine more so than women's minds. That's just how God made it. And so it is best, and so that's why God says a woman is to keep silent. In a natural process, when you've got God's completed word, a man is to read God's Word, get the sound doctrine, and teach it in the church. A woman is not to do that. A woman can read it and get the sound doctrine, but she's not allowed to usurp authority over a man. Therefore, she can't teach in a church. However, 1 Corinthians 11, when the head coverings are mentioned, the Word of God was not completed yet. And that was a segue into chapters 12 through 14, which is talking about the exercise of the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts were still in operation until the Word of God was completed. And the spiritual gifts, one of them is prophesying, which means you're speaking, thus saith the Lord. So today, if I want thus saith the Lord, I go to God's Word and I read it and I find out what God says. But back then, if I wanted to know what thus saith the Lord before the Word of God was complete, if certain doctrine was not expounded upon in Scripture yet because it had not been completed, then God would speak His Word through prophets. There may have been intermediaries of tongue talking and interpretation of tongues, but uh, bottom line is there had to be somebody, a prophet, who says this is the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians 14, uh, verse 37, Paul says, If any man be spiritual, uh, let him show that the words that I speak are the commandments of the Lord. It took a prophet to say, 1 Corinthians is thus saith the Lord, it's a word from the Lord, whereas some other epistle that Paul wrote that's not in the Bible is not God's word. It took God speaking that through a prophet to figure that out. So, again, since Galatians 3 says, there is neither male or female in the body of Christ, we are all one in Christ Jesus. 
what that means is when when God speaks the word see when I use the Bible and I get the Holy Ghost to teach it to me and then I speak it in a church I have to use my mind at some point to at least turn off my mind and use the mind of Christ I have to make the decision to use the mind of Christ and allow the Holy Ghost to teach me God's Word and then to teach it to others but if you are a prophet and you don't have the part of you reading the Bible and getting the Holy Ghost to teach it to you then what it is is the Holy Ghost just tells you what to say you have that in the book of Mark where Jesus says when you are delivered up to councils you are arrested and he says take no thought what you're going to speak for in that hour the words I will give you the words it's the Holy Ghost who will speak through you so when you have the gift of prophecy before God's word is completed you had God speaking directly through people and when God spoke directly through people and had no part of you your flesh having to get out of the way or using your intellect or anything like that to find out what God's Word says it's entirely a hundred percent the Lord involved in that process and you don't really have any control over it when that happens it could be either a man or a woman because the brain isn't associated with it it's God and since there's neither male nor female according to God you know in the spiritual realm then God can use a man or he can use a woman when Jesus was brought to the temple to be circumcised on the eighth day, Anna, a prophetess, a woman, spoke. Um, Mary speaks about the goodness of God. Um, she's a prophet there as well in the book of Luke, chapter 1. The point is that when you have prophecies, when you have, thus saith the Lord, then it is a woman or a man who could speak whereas if it's just God's completed word and you don't have the spiritual gifts like today then it's only men a woman is not to usurp authority over the man and so what Paul says is still the woman is subject to the man 1 Corinthians 11 so the whole talk in 1 Corinthians 11 is to say that when you have the time of spiritual gifts being exercised without God's completed word and a woman is exercising those gifts in your flesh you may look at that and say that a woman is having control over a man so to keep you from doing from coming to that conclusion Paul says the women are to wear head coverings to cover their head to show that they recognize that they are not the ones speaking it is God speaking through them therefore you don't have to worry therefore the woman has not usurped authority over the man even though the woman took charge of the service by speaking thus saith the Lord it was really God speaking through her and everybody would recognize that through the head covering and it is in that context that Paul says he says basically the head covering will work for that purpose because God has provided a natural head covering for women and that is long hair whereas the man is doesn't have the long hair so naturally speaking men should have short hair and women should have long hair that's uh, where that so that's the context of why it says that but Remember, we're not under the law, but we're under grace. So the question you have to ask for any decision you make isn't, is it a sin for men to have long hair? Because that's our original question from the book, by the way. The question you ask is, how does Christ live in me? And in the culture that we're in, we so far go by nature. If you see a woman's head shaven, you're more likely to think she's a lesbian doesn't mean that but you're more likely to think that and if you see a man's hair being real long you're more likely to think he's gay again doesn't necessarily mean that and as a Christian you can a man can have long hair and a woman can shave her hair uh, and it's not a sin because 
we're not under the law, we're under grace. But it's just you have to come to the conclusion as to what glorifies God more. Personally, I usually have my hair really short. It's because that way I spend less time with my hair. I think it's better for women to have short hair as well because then they spend less time. I think it's better for everybody to have short hair because then they spend less time with their hair and then they have more time to devote to the Lord. But, you know, it's up to you. Circumstances will tell you in where you are in your walk with Christ, using the mind of Christ, prioritizing it. Basically, just ask the question, based upon the culture, based upon my spiritual maturity level, uh, based upon the circumstances that I'm in, what is best for me to have either long hair or to have short hair? And I think in most cases, Christians should, either men or women, have short hair. But, again, it just depends on the circumstances, your maturity level, um, what you can afford, uh, what it's going to do to you. Will you spend more time serving the Lord if you have long or you have short hair? That's how you make the decision. The, my whole point in explaining this is in 1 Corinthians 11 to show you that that is a reference to the head coverings in relation to the gift of prophecy and praying that women may exercise in the church. But since that isn't going on today, then it doesn't matter. It's up to you. And especially since you're under grace and not under the law. So um, you have the freedom to choose. And so is it a sin for men to have long hair? Well, again, it's just like any other question. If you're in faith, if you make the decision based upon sound doctrine, uh, whether it's long or short hair, it's not a sin. And if you make the decision based upon your flesh, whether it's long or short hair, it is a sin. Whatsoever is not a faith is a sin. Romans 14, 23. My opinion, my personal view is that all men and women should have short hair, but that's not going to, uh, that necessarily means a sin or not. All right, thanks for watching.